I feel like I spent a bunch of time at the beginning of my career learning JavaScript, and then I kind of focused on learning other stuff and didn't realize that there were a lot of cool improvements being made to JavaScript. So in this video, we're going to look at five things that in recent years I've discovered you can do in JavaScript, and maybe some of these will be new to you as well. We're going to start, of course, with some TypeScript. I can't have a video without TypeScript, I guess. We've got this function here, find jobs by type and date. And of course, we have this job type. The reason we're looking at functions and we have some TypeScript here is because I want to talk about the bind function or the bind method that functions have. Now, usually bind is used to create a new function where the value of this inside your original function is bound to a specific object. In a lot of the code I'm writing these days, I don't actually use this very much at all. For the most part, I'm doing functional style programming. However, bind can also do currying. Now, if you're not familiar with currying, the idea is that we can bind essentially some of the arguments of a function and have a new function that takes a subset of those arguments. So we've got find jobs by type and date. Well, maybe I want to create a new function called specifically, maybe we'll call this find email jobs. And what we can do is we can make a call to find jobs by type and date, but we're not actually calling the function. We're going to do a bind. First argument can be null because there's no this in this function. So we can just uh, use null there. Notice that we now actually have a second argument that we can type. And the really cool thing about this is that TypeScript completely recognizes what's going on here. It recognizes that in the case of arg0, or the first arg that goes to our find jobs by type and date function, we can actually include either send email or process order. I'm going to use send email. There we go. We have bound a new function. The type now of find email jobs is just a function that takes our enqueued on date and returns a promise of jobs. So it essentially has the same signature as our original function, but we've already bound the value of the type argument using the string send email. So we've already supplied that argument and now we can call our new function here only needing to supply the remaining arguments. The second tip today is about the nullish coalescing operator, which is a great way to provide a default value for a variable. You've probably provided a default value before or using the or operator. Either one of these syntaxes works where we do or equals or we can do val1 equals val1 or true. In this example, we have val1, which could be undefined or it could be a Boolean. We want to make sure at this point in our code that it actually is a Boolean. And so if the user did not pass us a value for val1, then we want it to, in this case, default to true. However, there is a bit of a problem in this particular case because if we look at the type of val1, of course, undefined or Boolean, and if we look at the type of val1 down here, notice that TypeScript is recognizing the problem that we have. The value of val1 is always going to be true. And this is because there are only three possible values for val1, undefined, true, or false. And what we're saying here is if the left side of our operator is a falsy value, we want to use true. Well, both undefined and false are falsy values. One of the problems with JavaScript is that there are things other than false that do equate to false. And so this actually doesn't really work. If our calling code passes false as the value, this is actually going to overwrite it with true. This is solved by using the nullish coalescing operator, which is a relatively new operator in JavaScript. And it's just a double question mark. Here, we only use the left side in the case where it is not null or undefined. So essentially, the double question mark looks for values that are not null and not undefined. But if it does find null or undefined, then it will use the right side. The reason this is a better option with, of course, Booleans, but the same thing would be true about strings and numbers is because now we can actually use those values that are actually considered falsy as correct configuration. So now if we hover over val1 down here, TypeScript is showing us that JavaScript is doing the right thing. Now val1 is a Boolean. Could be true, could be false. If val1 up here is false, then this is not actually going to overwrite it. So the nullish coalescing operator, most of the time when you've used or in the past is probably the thing you want to use now because it will make sure that we don't clobber any falsy values that are not null or undefined. Tip three is about classes. So if the functional programming isn't really your style, maybe this will be interesting for you. TypeScript, of course, gives us private as a modifier here. And so we can create these private fields in our classes, right? And you can see in our first example here where we have a new instance of our C1 class, we can't actually read the secret property because it's private. Totally makes sense. However, there is a problem here. And let me show you what's happening. If I convert this into JavaScript, notice we have our C1 class here. We assign our secret property here, but there's no mention of private 
anywhere in JavaScript here. And of course, if we look down here at our actual code, yeah, this should work just fine. We can read that property. There's nothing stopping us there. This is definitely one of the problems with using private fields in TypeScript. They're not actually private in the JavaScript. And so like in TypeScript here, we can cast C1 to be some other object. And now we can access that no problem. What is the better way to do this? Well, the better way to do private fields is using the private syntax that is actually supported by JavaScript now. And that is denoting a private field with the pound sign or the hash character. So notice down here with our example, we create our C2 instance, and then we try and access that field. And we can't do it because property secret is not accessible outside of class C2 because it has a private identifier. And of course, the generated JavaScript as well is pretty interesting. Instead of using actual this dot property syntax, like we do with the traditional class here, we actually create this weak map and set this up this way. Now we're doing this here because this particular TypeScript configuration is actually targeting an older version of the ECMAScript standard. We can actually change that if we pop up to the TS config here, change our target to ES 2022. And now this uses the new syntax. So in ES 2022, if we target that, we get the exact same syntax. Now it looks like this might actually still work, but let's do a quick test here. I'm going to copy this code out of the TypeScript playground. Let's pop over here to my terminal and I'll just paste this in. When we create our instance of C1, we can read that secret. When we create our instance of C2, we actually get an error private field secret must be declared in an enclosing class. So we can't actually use this unless we're inside of C2, the class. We're going to stay here on the terminal for tip number four. This is honestly just a weird little thing about JavaScript that I run into occasionally. And so I'm going to share this. Typically, when you're creating a new array in JavaScript, you're just creating it with the array literal syntax. But sometimes you want an array of a particular size. And so often I will use the array constructor. So if I want an array of five elements, I can create it like this. But notice that our new array is a sparse array. There's not actually five like undefined values in there. Now, what we can do is use array.fill and we can fill all of those empty slots with some particular value. So for example, I could fill it with zero and now I have five zeros. However, the trick I want to talk about here is what happens when you want to make a two dimensional array and you want to fill it with arrays. I've seen a lot of people reach for this syntax where you new up your array and then you fill and you pass it an empty array. And this kind of looks like it works. However, there's a catch here. The catch can be seen if I index into my first array and let's push a value into that. But now if we look at the array, it looks like we've pushed a value into all of them. And we kind of have, because what's going on here is this is the same array being referenced five times inside of our outer array. What's happening here with fill is we create a new instance of an array literal in the argument there. And that same instance is put into every one of our slots in the array. Kind of useless and really not at all what we want here. How do I get around this? Well, the simple syntax that I use is to first fill it with something that I don't care about, for example, zero, and then map over that array. Again, I don't care about the value. But inside of our function, we can create a new array literal there. And of course, because this function will run one time for every item in our outer array, we're going to get five new internal arrays. If I index into the first thing and push a value, then you can see that we've only pushed this value into the first slot as we would expect. And we have four other unique arrays here, all empty. You might wonder why we need this fill in here at all. And the truth is that we can't map over a sparse array. If there's no items in the array, we're going to get nothing. We could try this with a new array here and we just directly go into our map and try and map it into and try and map into an empty array, you can see we still get a sparse array, five empty items, because map only loops over items that are actually there in the array. Tip number five is also about arrays here. So we've got our array of five elements here. And of course, we know that we can index into it by using square bracket syntax. One thing you can do in a lot of other languages that you can't do in JavaScript is reference with a negative index. So if we say negative one here, we want to get this last item in the list. So unfortunately, this syntax doesn't work in JavaScript, but there is an array method that we can use. And this is array.at. So we could use at zero and we could push a new value in there. And you can see now that we've used at zero, we were referencing the first value in the array. However, if instead we said, let's get array at minus one, and we could push say, well, why don't we push the value minus one into that? You can see that we've pushed the value minus one into our last array. And if we change these both to minus two, what we should see is 
Now we've pushed a value into the second last array. And so we can use at to index both positively and negatively, depending on which side of the array you want to walk through. So these are five quick tips on things that you may not have known you could do in JavaScript. I think TypeScript gets a lot of love out there these days, which of course I mean, I love, but JavaScript itself is still a growing language, still a lot of cool stuff happening there. And so if you know of some JavaScript tip that you think a lot of people should hear about, definitely put it down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.